Hello and welcome to All Indians Matter. I am Ashraf Engineer. Regional rural banks or RRBs are government-owned, scheduled commercial banks that operate at a regional level. They were created almost four decades ago to provide rural areas with basic banking and financial services, including credit for agriculture and other sectors. This last bit is of particular importance today. It's these banks that also carry out certain government operations like disbursement of pensions and rega wages. They also provide para-banking facilities like lockers, debit and credit cards, mobile banking and UPI services. FY21-22 was a watershed year for RRBs as the government, along with state governments and sponsor banks, decided to infuse 10,890 crore rupees to recapitalize RRBs over 21-22 and 22-23. This was to be accompanied by operational and governance reforms under the Sustainable Viability Plan with a well-defined implementation mechanism aimed at credit expansion, business diversification, non-performing asset reduction, cost rationalization, technology adoption and improvement of governance. How far has this plan progressed and why are RRBs so critical to the rural and therefore the overall national economy? All Indians Matter we have on the show Davinder Sandhu, who has more than 35 years of experience in policy formulation, infrastructure development and advisory. Davinder is co-founder and chairman of Primus Partners, a leading advisory firm. Earlier, he was the sector director for transport and disaster management at the Prime Minister's office. Davinder has been the country representative at the executive board of the World Bank Group and the head of network operations at the Indian Railways. As part of his work with the government, Davinder designed and drove large transformational projects managed and monitored policies, laws, regulatory regimes, public-private partnerships and international collaborations. Moreover, Davinder has been a delegate at various international forums such as the UN General Assembly, ASEAN, BRICS and SARC for international bilateral and multilateral policy dialogues. Welcome, Davinder. Hi, Ashraf. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And uh, I think that subject that you're touching is of very critical importance because Financial inclusion, you know, remains one of the sort of holy grails uh, that we need to take forward. It's an answer to a part of the mix of taking the largest mass of uh, people in one country. You know, almost the largest uh, China has more today, but in another few years, we'll be the most populous. Yeah, absolutely. And it is recognized that we have an agriculture sector, we have a rural population, and that there is need for moving beyond poverty and moving into middle income. And I think that critical piece of financial inclusion, uh, there are many, you know, sort of platforms being engineered around it. But uh, the subject that you've chosen to discuss today, regional rural banks, is a very critical uh, part of that entire equation. So very happy to be here. Right. And so then that's a good segue actually into the first question. What exactly are RRBs and why were they set up and what's been their journey since they set up? So as I was saying, if you look at... Uh, Let's go back to early 50s and look at India, a recently independent nation with a very clear view of finding its heft on the global stage, but also understood that this was an agrarian economy, uh, continues to be till today in terms of the labor participation when 65% of the people are dependent on agriculture. And the fact that there was illiteracy and the fact that the country need to be brought together on various program platforms. And famines were the norm in India for many, 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 many centuries. And if we didn't have food security, we can't survive as a nation. So if you look at that, then in keeping with the Indian ethos of cooperative decision making, you know, we had panchayats and, you know, the rural system and the punch system, you know, since generations and centuries. Therefore, the first sort of thought that came in was uh, the cooperative banking. And so the government picked out cooperative banking as a, one of the fundamentals. And then uh, got together people in villages and a conglomeration of villages called blocks to actually become leaders of that cooperative banking space and then manage to facilitate agriculture, largely through, of course, supply of uh, agriculture inputs, uh, fertilizer, pesticides, and the kind of things that were needed for ramping up agriculture yield in India. So that's, that was the first step that was taken, that you know the cooperative banks came in. At the same time, there was a transition to the commercial banking sector. And as you know, most of the banks were private, but some public sector banks also came in before, of course, nationalization took place in around 1969. So here was this, you know, cooperative banks already in place. 
and there was this desire to move to the next step of you know full scale banking but the policymakers understood that perhaps there is need for an interim step and that's why in the mid 70s in, in 1976 exactly uh, the government set up an act to set up the rrbs as that kind of uh, you know mechanism that married the requirements of the agriculture as a priority sector serving the rural economy but at the same time bringing into the cooperative system uh, more advanced methods of banking of you know risk mitigation understanding the ratios that need to be maintained credit deposit ratios and things like that because those were the things that were not part of the cooperative banking uh, in that large sort of professionalized way so one of the main roles that rrb has had is look at the rural populations look at the underserved areas but then induct into the banking system better systems in a gradual basis from more core professional banking services so it was at halfway house that created and i think that continues to be a kind of a bridge role that the rrbs uh, continue to play in the country till today in almost all regions that you can think of yeah and you know uh, very few people know that rrbs have 28.3 crore depositors and 2.6 crore borrowers as many as 30 of the 43 rrbs collectively earned a profit of 1682 crore rupees in fy21 now yet there isn't much public discussion about rrbs could you explain what role they play in the overall national economy let's start sort of start with what was the objective financial inclusion was the objective and then transitioning from very basic cooperative banking to you know advanced methods of banking and then the rrbs as the middle point now if you see the number of depositors at 28 crores but the number of borrowers only at around 2.6 crores so that means uh, you know out of the total depositor base only 10% people were demanding credit and going forward in one sense that's the challenge because cooperative banking has got lax criteria i mean they are in a more helpful mode in that sense and they are dependent largely on community driving the banking behavior and the financial behavior of people but the rrbs as a kind of a quasi bank nearer to the people trying to speak their language i think that's one problem that has happened that they have not been able to be a large part of the credit disbursement mechanism so you know while i think there are other reasons that are clearly available that we can think of in today's times i mean one is rrbs have full not adopted the banking which is fully the internet penetration is low and some part of that is government's own policies about the you know the risk weights and the credit ratios and their you know their relationship with each other before they allow internet banking but that's i think today something that is recognized that those limited number of activities that rrbs are allowed in terms of credit dispersal and the fact that uh, they are not allowed much internet banking and you know they still remain largely brick and mortar i think those are the issues that impact them and there is realization within the government to do that but let's see how that happens because you know one thought that is there you know is maybe an sbi kind of a you know agglomeration uh, you know where you are able to take away some of the profit making rrbs and put them together with the others and have a better result but overall the job that they were assigned to do they did reasonably well but i think now there is perhaps a time for rrb 2.0 to leverage that forward yeah and actually agriculture credit has been in the news uh, quite a bit recently now have rrb succeeded in making many inroads say i ask because farmers continue to commit suicide due to debt or to local money lenders naturally they turn to money lenders because they couldn't get institutionalized credit so one problem uh, ashad is uh, acute uh, when you look at the conventional banking scenario the bank demands collateral and you know one part is that sometimes the borrower is asking for more than you know what what his collateral can sustain but then uh, you know the other problem is that uh, the rural uh, landholder is sometimes not willing to put up his land as collateral because he sees that his prime base of existence i mean i exist because i have land you know uh, they used with a latin phrase of uh, i think therefore i am but i think in the india's rural communities i have land therefore i am and therefore to you know try to pass it off as a collateral into some working capital that he needs for agriculture has been a problem that's why they actually the cooperative banking system uh, is very strong it doesn't demand collateral it simply demands you to sign up in the member of the society and then there is you know societal pressure uh, in making sure that you don't default if you see working capital that is demanded by farmers is not very large but the rrb is uh, moving towards the banking framework 
and looking at collaterals for large parts of the working capital finance has been a bit of a problem for them. If you see what's happening, that when you see those farmers who can be served better by the cooperative space, they remain there. And if you see those farmers who need larger amounts of working capital, maybe they are mechanizing, you know, maybe they're automating, they're buying tractors, etc. Then the, you know, the conventional banks, the conventional commercial banks, backed by priority sector lending programs in their, uh, uh, you know, bucket, that's where they have taken over. So while the bridge is there, but the bridge is not growing enough to either move bravely enough to a non-collateralized space and not moving in a very modern way to tap those who can go to a commercial bank. I think that's where I think the solution would come from addressing this issue of uh, classifying farmers as those eligible for non-collateral, serving them, and then those who can offer collateral, serving them in a way better or equally competitively as with the conventional commercial bank. What about other sectors like uh, rural handicrafts? Have uh, RRB supported them adequately? So RRBs, in fact, have done a good role in this part because when you look at the a part of the rural area that has now convinced, uh, you know, uh, sort of transitioned to entrepreneurial space, one important aspect of that is the self-help groups, largely women, handicrafts and, you know, simple processing like making masalas and grinding and things like that. And so that's something that was a good step by them. The other opportunity that is presenting itself nowadays is with the government's uh, efforts on farmer producer organizations. Uh, the FPOs where you can do larger pre-processing and maybe final processing of the agriculture output and the basic output as it goes out of the village and therefore retain a greater part of the value addition into the rural economy. So this is, I think, where uh, the greater support is needed and then the RRBs have now started to move out and have specific targets for moving forward on this. But still, clearly, much work to be done. Again, if you look at the self-help groups, there are a large number of non-banking financial companies that have entered that space. And uh, they serve very competitively, sometimes even at higher interest rates. So there are lessons to be learned there. The RRB is moving in. But again, as we said, a uh, lot of learning to be done here. Yeah. Uh, the NABA research uh, title study on improving operational and financial efficiency of RRBs and which Primus was involved in says RRBs have a heavily skewed portfolio in favor of agriculture because of the purpose which you have also outlined. However, this is not necessarily the best thing for the bank. So what's the way out? So I think the important thing is that, you know, if you look at pure agriculture, that's where the sort of risk reward ratio even for the entrepreneur, I mean, in this case, what we call an entrepreneur is a farmer. You know, that's not very high. So there's not much sort of, you know, delta available in pure agri space. But I think rather than move to, you know, industry, if the RRBs are able to focus and really work uh, on a lot of government schemes in terms of FPOs we have mentioned, in terms of food parks that are coming up all over the place, and in terms of uh, the smaller MSMEs, you know, the 50 lakh investment, the one less than one crore investment, really micro systems that are there, but otherwise with huge potential to generate employment and also stem, you know, rural to urban migration, which is causing a huge problem. If they enter that space, one, of course, is great for the country. I mean, that's the bridge that they were supposed to be and migrate to being better in the next phase. But also the fact that that is where the profits are available and that's where uh, their portfolios will become less risky the loan loss provisioning on their portfolios will go down. And in fact, they can have more deposits to deploy uh, in accordance with the rules of RBI. Currently, if most of the lending gets into the agri space, then as per rules, uh, they have to do a lot of provisioning uh, on their balance sheets. So that's why we are saying that if you move on to other sectors, yes, don't give up agriculture, become sharper at it, use fintech, whatever that needs to be done there. But at the same time, if you move on to others, then the risk rate of your portfolio goes down and you are able to deploy more and obviously perhaps earn more and become more profitable. I think there's an interesting point you made about MSMEs. And I think uh, in recent times, the government has also pushed uh, RRBs into supporting MSMEs, isn't it? So I think the this entire mudra scheme is something that was heavily leveraged on RRBs. And uh, at least our first studies that we've started do, you know, doing in this are giving us an impression that the RRBs have done much better, in fact, than the commercial banks. If you recall the Mudra scheme uh, with, you know, fabulous amount of capital available, some three lakh crores uh, over the last five years, while the Mudra scheme says that the MSME can actually borrow without collateral, but the commercial banks 
actual experience on the ground was that they would always insist on collateral. I think the RRBs filled that very well. And those uh, smaller entrepreneurs who were already working with the RRBs came back to the RRBs after they were sort of rejected by the commercial banks and a lot of mudra uh, scheme was deployed from there. Secondly, those you know persons who are having their Manrega accounts with RRBs and if there are any savings that are being left over in those Manrega accounts, they are leveraging those also as some kind of a you know, collateral again for borrowing small sums, you know, maybe uh, some as small as 50,000 or 70,000 or whatever, but for setting up a tea stall or, you know, samosa shop or something, which is a very critical employment provider. I mean, services is the way forward. And uh, so that's, I think, where the RRBs are doing better, in fact. I won't call it the MSMEs as such, but let's say the micro amongst the MSMEs. Those people who were not served by the commercial banks are now going back to the RRBs under the Mudra scheme, and that's where the MSMEs are doing better. I also believe that there is a good experience from the MSMEs in terms of uh, discounting of trade receivable vouchers. That's, again, something that's a government scheme, trades as a government scheme, and the RRBs have done well in that respect. Right. Let's talk about NPS for a second. Now, RRBs have historically witnessed higher gross non-performing asset ratios than commercial banks. As of March 2021, the NPA ratio of commercial banks was 7.3% of the advances, while that of RRBs was 9.4%. Now, this is RBI data. How can this be reduced? So, if you go back to the one question that you asked me before, I mean, okay, NPAs is a fact of life. We know all companies and all endeavors that start off don't end up well. And I think every economy and every country and every society must have the sort of bravery and the courage to allow some companies and parts to fail and accept as part of normal progress. I mean, if you look back, I mean, let's say, you know, the railways in India. I mean, you had investors in the UK who were actually investing in private railways in India and they knew that they were taking a risk. So that risk taking ability is, is very much a part of life. And therefore, NPAs are normal. But yes, you're right that uh, the greater amount of NPAs lies in RRB in terms of the percentage of their portfolio. And that's again to be expected because they are serving a population that's not you know, very financially savvy. But I see it as a good step. I see, you know, because at the end of the day, there are, you know, farm loan waiver schemes and, you know, all kinds of things that happen. At least this is a funding of somebody who wanted to do something and didn't succeed because the way I look at things, this is a class of people in the villages who need entrepreneurship training and what better training than hands-on. If I tried something and I worked hard at it and it didn't work, I have still got a learning of what didn't work. And next time when I do something, hopefully I'll make a lesser mistake. So I'm really not worried about NPAs and RRB. I mean, it's a small sum a depositor base compared you know, to the whole national banking system. So percentage is one way of looking at things. But if you look at the total figure, it's not that much. And I see it personally simply as a training cost of India's bottom 50% into an entrepreneurial and services space next time. This time they did work. Next time it will. So that's perfectly all right. So I don't blame the RRBs on that. I think merely because they've been asked to target a population that's not financially savvy. So some amount of higher risk is very much part of their portfolio. And recognizing that the government is taking some steps of the capitalization, as you yourself mentioned, has happened. And possibly, uh, you know, a kind of uh, bringing them together, like the State Bank of India has brought together and, you know, ruling in a scheme where the non-profitable and the profitable are put together. And I think it all works in the long run. But for me, that's really not a big cause for worry. I think it's training of India's bottom 50% and it's very welcome. Yeah, I think that's a great point that you've made. I think two points. One is look upon it differently. The perspective as training of India's bottom 50% and B, percentage terms of NPAs may be higher, but actually the sum itself is not as high as you might expect. I think those both are important points to think about. Now, there are parts of India that are less developed than the rest. For instance, in the past, we kept referring to the Bimaru states, but even today, the eastern region is certainly a concern. Have RRBs focused on any particular regions or, uh, and if yes, what have they done? If not, is there something that they can do? So RRBs, again, Ashraf are actually, I mean, they're instruments of government policy. And the fact that this vast nation, I mean, it had, you know, different ways of growing. It had underserved areas. It had better served areas. I mean, that's the way it was. 
And the endeavor of the government of India, I mean, right since 1947 has to be, how do we get, you know, balanced regional development? Naturally, on the basis of factor strength, very, very lately. So if you look at some states, they became mineral states and steel and iron ore, and somebody became agriculture and somebody became industry. And so that was the way it was. And I think the regional rural banks did well to induct that capacity on a regional basis. I mean, if you look at the Northwestern banks, they, they're very great at agriculture extension services and providing those parts. But then if you look at the banks in, say, Kalahandi or Orissa, etc., they're very good at social welfare protection and, you know, working with uh, deployment of those funds and working with that kind of class of people. You specifically asked me a question about the Northeast. Now, the Northeast is, again, it's a matter of government policy. I mean, we know that uh, Northeast has been disturbed for, for many, many years. It was. And the government worked with those people to make sure that there were no shortage of uh, commodities, etc. But then development has come to Northeast over the last sort of 20, 25 years. The special accelerated development program of the road sector for Northeast, the development of the inland waterway sector, opening of the bamboo, you know, bamboo missions. So I think there's a different way of looking at Northeast and Northeast itself has done very well. A lot of educational institutes have been pushed in and therefore tourism services and all those things have come up. If the RRBs in the Northeast and even the cooperative system in the Northeast, you know, had not worked, it would have been difficult. Practically speaking, when security is an issue, and if you look at financial institutions where security would always be a bigger issue, you know, if you send somebody, you know, from Mumbai to, you know, just as I mentioned, to go and work in Manipur or Manipal or somewhere, maybe there was a concern 25 or 30 years ago. But if you had a local regional rural bank deployed with local local people, that was able to serve it much better. And as I said, since government policy has transitioned, in case of the Northeast, now it sees that as a pure focus of development. Therefore, that role is very, very well being played by the regional rural banks. Could you talk us uh, through an example of an RRB making a real difference on the ground? So, one example I've given, of course, is the the Northeast uh, is one example. But uh, the other example that I would give is uh, the garment industry in Jharkhand. You know, again, it's a left-wing extremism uh, affected area. If you look at Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, they have been traditional problems. And uh, the central and the state governments have been working with the local people and leaderships to get that right. But then also to understand what can be done. And so working with the tribals, identifying garments and uh, tailoring and those handicrafts as very important. Working with uh, the private sector, first as kind of a CSR activity, even when the word CSR and it was not there officially, working as a kind of, you know, a charitable activity and working and bringing garment industry to Jharkhand in a big way. I think the ability to reach the smaller areas, the ability to reach, you know, local chawls and things like that, and working with the women of that area, that is a very good example of what the RRBs have done for the garment industry in, in Jharkhand. I mean, I, I we don't have a case study for that, but because I worked in Jharkhand quite a bit on Swachh Bharat and Amrut and the smart city schemes for four years, and I saw that happening, that how uh, the RRBs uh, were going down and facilitating the growth of uh, government industry in Jharkhand. It's a big success at this point of time. Right. Uh, now, in October 2022, it was announced that RRBs will be eligible to list on stock exchanges to raise funds if they have a net worth of at least 300 crore over the previous three years and if they fulfill certain other criteria. Is this a good thing, bad thing? What difference will it make to the RRBs? So, I see this as an experiment. It's important to clearly, I mean, there is now. There is a different way of doing things and asking them to step up to this challenge of doing that. Now, it can be any scheme, Ashraf. I mean, I, I mean, certainly it's a scheme with good intentions. That's not what we're trying to say. But the point is that any scheme that is tried must stay there for a stable period of time. Because if I'm borrowing against that scheme, whether I'm the RRB or whether I'm the borrower, I'm taking a call in my balance sheet for two, three, four, five years. And therefore, have the courage to wait and see how this works. I think it's a little too early to, you know, pass a judgment on this either or the other way, or this way or that way. My point would be, okay, you've taken a call, stay with it for four or five years and see how it operates. And don't be in a hurry. You can always have, you know, good and bad results in the short run. But when you're looking at asset financing and you're looking at people, you know, making livelihoods out of this kind of uh, borrowing and lending, then be there for four or five years and over a period of time, see how it works and tweak it in accordance with that. But that's my view about it. 
I don't want to say yes, no, or anything at this stage. I know you've spoken about this a little bit in your, one of your earlier answers, but uh, and I want to just probe this a little more. Have RRBs adopted technology well enough? Uh, if not, what more could they do? So one part, if you remember, we had said that the RBI's own instructions were not very helpful in allowing the RRBs to actually propagate a lot of technology. But then I, I look at technology from two points of view. I mean, at the end of the day, the whole idea is to serve the consumer well. And technology is not just about wires and phones and internet. I mean, technology is the way you do things. So one way of looking at technology is, can I provide, let's say, a motorized conveyance to my banking correspondent on behalf of RRB, who's able to reach quicker? For me, that is also technology. So some of those things RRBs have been doing, but I think there is need for a little more aggression on that. Perhaps they are not in a very competitive mode at this point of time. My advice to, you know, earlier the EPFO organization, for whom I was a trainer for many years, and to the RRB organization has always been, nothing remains the same. The RRB of today will not be the RRB of 10 years. And increasingly, if you're not able to answer the challenge, you will find a problem. So on behalf of your customers, please advocate. Get the appropriate certifications and the authorizations that you need from the Ministry of Finance and from the RBI and try to take on a larger role. In fact, because of the fact that they are so well dispersed and so well nearer to the consumer, if they use today modern techniques of fintech and become less uh, dependent on brick and mortar, and the fact that the government itself is going digitizing uh, DBT and you know the jam trinity and all those things we know. So the time for them to do that is now. It's not enough to say, oh, government is not allowing me to do this. I think advocate it for yourself because it's your own interest and the interest of your consumer. Yes, so they can do better. Right. And in fact, uh, the RBI in its statement on development and regulatory policies has uh, proposed to ease norms for internet banking for customers of RRBs. So this should actually help them in the purpose that you mentioned. Yeah. So what is happening is that today they are receiving some services like, you know, uh, balance inquiries and, you know, statements and downloads. But finally, they have to be enabled, you know, to be able to conduct complete banking on the technology platform. And that's the point I was saying, that rather than just be satisfied with what you're allowed to do, if your customer today is demanding more, and if the NBFCs are reaching with the apps and things like that to your customer, and you really want to put that on your balance sheet, which we know will decrease the risk weight on your balance sheets, then go ahead and advocate and get that done. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. And what other RRB reforms would you like to see? So one part that I would like to see is a greater induction of capacity. I think uh, that is uh, one thing that is being overlooked at this stage. We need to prepare the RRB for the citizen of tomorrow. And therefore, the person who is dealing with RRBs right from the top to the teller level or uh, to the banking correspondent level is somebody who has to be uh, up to that. I think there are very conventional ways of looking at RRB capacity and we need to change that. So, I mean, not just uh, technology in banking interface, but even in technology in learning management systems uh, for the RRB itself. That's clearly important. Then I think there are much more online methods of understanding consumer behavior now. And therefore, rather than wait, you know, a long period where recovery becomes impossible, if there is a possibility of using technology and finding out uh, the likely problems that may occur in an account, I think some preemptive action in, in that case is better. And one part that I would like to recommend to RRBs is that community pressure, you know, for example, which cooperative uses, uh, don't give that up because that's very, very important. And I'm sure you'll be surprised to know that in a neighboring country of, uh, of Nepal, NPAs are nearly zero. Uh, you'll be, I mean, people get surprised. Yeah. That. And people write their agreements on, you know, a piece of paper which they deem to be holy. It's not even printed by the government. You can get that holy paper from any stationer. There's just a way of making it. And when people sign off on that, they abide by it. So I think there are those very strong parts of, you know, uh, discharging your responsibilities, being responsible, that lie deep within communities that are already served. So I think that's also something that they can even gamify it they can use technology to, you know, bring those attitudes forth. So I think work, uh, you know, use technology and leverage that. That would also be something that will be very good for the profitability and decreasing the NPAs in the long run. Now, I mean, low productivity, etc. all those things have been spoken of. But I think as long as they focus on their customer, they advocate for their customer, and then move forward, you know, 
uh, with better capacity in loading the risk weight on their portfolios, working with the communities, as I said, to you know, sort of highlight certain good behavior attributes that lie within the Indian communities. Uh, that's what I would suggest to them. I think it's kind of a holistic view that I have of the RRB working with the community it knows, which is different from any urban bank in ABC locality serving one lakh people it doesn't know. You know, so so there's a different way of looking at the RRB as I'm saying. It's much nearer. Therefore, the community attributes and the focus on the community and fighting for them, I think that would be very good for them. Absolutely. So tell us about Primus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Ashraf. So I mean, uh, you know, this is this is uh, six co-founders uh, came from strategy firms and the big fours, and uh, basically, you know, we thought we needed to do things differently. Those large firms, those global firms, have got a lot of advantages, but then the larger you grow, we felt that senior level attention to clients decreases, and all of us actually who came out and we were hey, we have been discussing this with ourselves for some time. So that's the basic idea with which we came together. Number one, we will ensure that our span of control on the work that we do is such that we ourselves don't lose touch with the project because the client wants to see senior level intervention. That's why you're brought there. So that's something that we work on very closely. Secondly, India is at our heart. We, you know, make no bones about that. And with all clients, we are very you know, polite, but we put forward our point of view when we feel that a conversation that is happening is not in India's interest. And we genuinely believe that if something is not in, in the interest of India, is not congruent with policy, then it's not going to be good for the firm also in the long run. So we try to bring both the public and the private sectors together in a manner that they can both move together for India's progress. There are some other markers that we wanted to do and we've implemented them. And I should be very proud to say that Today, perhaps, we are the most gender diversified firm in India. 54% of our employees are women. That was the first board resolution we passed, by the way, that we'll be a gender diversified firm. And that's what a wonderful culture to the firm. We thought we were being very, you know, SDG and gender empowering by taking that decision. But to all entrepreneurs, I can only say it makes the best business sense you can ever think of. So keep gender diversification clearly at the heart of your firm. And, you know, the magic happens in teamwork, uh, in communication, in a culture that's helping each other, very nurturant of each other. We don't have a defined hierarchy. I mean, I am chairman of the firm means that I have got some statutory functions to perform, but I don't consider myself the senior most. The senior most person in that sense on a project is a project manager. If I'm the project manager, then I call the shots. But if I'm some part of somebody's team, then that person calls the shot. It's better or whatever is the designation or the pay grade or things like that. So I think those are the kind of cultural markers that we wanted to set. I think we have succeeded. You know, we work as a team. We make sure that we are congruent with national policy. And uh, our clients have been very good to us. The initial trust. I think our teams have worked together to discharge that very well. And our credibility with both the public and the private sectors is a testimony to that. So I hope we stay true to our original markers uh, and continue to serve the country and our clients in the manner that we started. I'm glad you mentioned uh, gender diversity because there's study after study, research after research that says that uh, not only is it good for society, but it actually results uh, in better business uh, performance. Absolutely. So I'm so glad you mentioned that, but I think that's a different conversation. Uh, I want to ask you something that I ask all my guests at the end of the show. Why do you do this work? So let me go back to when I was didn't have that much white hair. In fact, I had no white hair. <laughs> my... I think we are all getting there. <laughs> <laughs> so I left a job in the corporate sector that was paying me thrice as much to join the civil service in 1987. And so that's what excites me personally, because I believe whatever I am is because of my country, is because of citizens like you who talk to me, mentor me, uh, even forgive my mistakes, you know, are comfortable and patient with me. And therefore, it's my responsibility that if I've learned something, I've, I've been taught, I've been trained, then I share that with everybody. And one part about Primus was that we also said that everything that we know will be transmitted to the client and to our teams because we want to permanently empower the client. We don't want to sit with the client for usually consultants say, you know, I want to be there forever. No, we're very clear. We're going to be there for a year, two years, whatever is this project. And then you're going to impart all we know on that project to the client so that, you know, 
the whole skill level is upgraded, whatever thoughts we have. And similarly, whatever we do, when we work with our teams, I share my experiences freely. And that's what all of us do with each other. So that whatever is in our heads is dispersed and, you know, is available to society for use. And that's what really excites me. You know, I always believe, Ashraf, I mean, I always tell everybody, I don't think I'm special in any way. I think life is a set of coincidences, you know, and something happened here and you went there and you went there. So, you know, you sat in various rooms. I mean, I went to the prime minister's office, represented country, at the board of the World Bank, you know, and so all those learnings uh, are something that I owe to come back to my society, to my country and to my teams and share all that I know so that our decisions are better informed and next steps are better. I think on a daily basis, when I sort of go back to sleep at the end of every day and I look and ask myself, did I share? Did I learn? And, you know, I think those are the fundamental questions that really drive me. And whether I'm happy or sad at the end of the day when I'm going back to sleep really depends whether I'm able to give myself the right answers or not. If I don't, then I wake up the next day to make sure that I take that forward. So that's what drives me. Share your learnings and make sure that whether it's a client or whether it's your staff, everybody is finding value in whatever is happening around you. Financial inclusion and coverage are critical for India to make any stride towards real progress and RRBs can play an important role on that front. Navinder, thank you for coming on the show and telling us how. Uh, Ashraf, it's been a privilege to speak to you. Thank you so much. Godspeed and have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you all for listening. Please visit allindiansmatter.in that's A-L-L-I-N-D-I-A-N-S-M-A-T-T-E-R.in for more columns and audio podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter at Ashraf Engineer, that's A-S-H-R-A-F-E-N-G-I-N-E-R and All Indians Count, that's A-L-L-I-N-D-I-A-N-S-C-O-U-N-T. Search for the All Indians Matter page on Facebook. On Instagram, the handle is All Indians Matter. Email me at editor at allindiansmatter.in. Catch you again soon. <laughs>